Good afternoon and welcome to Cancer Conversations, a program provided by UNC Lineberger's Comprehensive Cancer Center. My name is Jennifer Potter and I'll be your moderator today. Today we're going to talk about tobacco use, cigarettes and vaping, and we have the um, directors of our UNC Tobacco Treatment Program with us, Susan Trout and Laurel Sisler. But before we get started, I want to call your attention to the phone number and the email address on your screen. If you're having any trouble during the presentation with audio or visual, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We want to make sure you get this information today. I also want to let you know that at the bottom of every screen today during our presentation, there'll be an email address for questions. So once we're through with our presentation, we'll have enough time to answer any email questions that you submit to us. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Chow and Laurel Sisler. Hi, um, my name is Susan Trout and we welcome you. Today we're going to be talking about vaping, cigarettes, and tobacco use and how to quit. And we're excited to have you all with us today. Uh, we hope that today after this presentation what you'll learn is you'll recognize different tobacco products that are out there including e-cigarettes, uh, what's in them, the risks, and some of the possible benefits, and how to quit using tobacco including e-cigarettes. So there's different type of tobacco products, many of them you might be aware of and some of these might seem um, un new to you or unfamiliar. And we're going to talk about some of the associated health risks with them as we go along. Some of the ones we're going to cover today are cigarettes, little cigars, cigars and cigarillos. There's pipes, hookah or shisha, smokeless tobacco and e-cigarettes. So what something that we just want to share with everybody is that as most people know, uh, cigarettes are a harmful product, but they don't always know what is it that makes them so harmful. There are over 7,000 chemicals when they're burned. We know that 200 of these are poisonous and that of these, at least 69 of them are cancer causing. So there are many chemicals in them and it's not only the chemicals, but the burning of those chemicals that make them so dangerous. We're going to look here at this slide. It shows a little bit about North Carolina in comparison to the United States. And adults in the United States, there's about 17.1% who are using cigarettes. And this uh, data is from 2017. If you look there in the North Carolina area, it's 17.2%. So they're pretty equal. North Carolina is a pretty uh, standard for what the rest of the United States is. However, if you look in the high school student area, you'll see that there's actually a, a larger percentage of people in North Carolina. 12.1% of high school students have noted that they use cigarettes. And in comparison, across the US, it's 8.8%. So that really lets us know that uh, this is especially an area that we need to pay attention to in North Carolina. Um, the other thing is this data is based on the last 30 days. So when we're looking at this, this is cigarette use within the last 30 days. One thing um, to think about is there's certain things when people think about tobacco use and the damage that it may cause. We you know, often people think about lung disease, they think about lung cancer, they think about cardiovascular. However, we know that there are many areas within the body that are affected from our tobacco use. And this is, um, uh, this list just shows many areas that sometimes people haven't heard of or don't think about. And if you look in the areas that are red, these are areas that we have discovered newer links between tobacco use and um, medical conditions. So some things that some people aren't aware of is that diabetes, pregnancy, all of these things are impacted by our tobacco use. So when we think about health risks, we often think about things, you know, how is it that the smoking may cause things like cancer or COPD, but also there are things that can happen that can per cause some prevention areas. So if we think about pregnancy, sometimes people are going to have more risks with their pregnancy when they're smoking. So it can be more difficult to get pregnant if someone is smoking. So this is an area to talk with people about if they're thinking about family planning or if they recently become pregnant because we know there's an increased risk that people will have. Um, some of the things that have been associated with it are preterm delivery and stillbirth and low birth weight. And after a child is born, there are other areas that we have to think about, such as sudden infant death syndrome as well. 
when we also think about secondhand smoke, so we, we may think about this with children, but we also have to remember that it can impact adults as well. So some of the health effects with children that you could hear about is that children are at greater risk if they're exposed to secondhand smoke for ear infections, asthma attacks, different respiratory symptoms, and sudden infant death syndrome. And in general, adults are at greater risk too. So heart disease, lung cancer, stroke, all of these things when people are exposed to being around that secondhand smoke. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the products. So there's products that many of you probably have heard of. Um, we often think about, you know, in general, the, the standard cigarette. But there's other products that are out there just to be aware of. There's Little Cigar, Cigars, and Cigarellos. And all of the tobacco products that are out there do potentially cause some harm to people. And so none of these are free of harm. The thing about cig cigars that we think about is that they're actually wrapped in tobacco leaves, and many of them can be flavored. And the fact that they can be flavored can be really appealing to youth, and we have to be aware of that because we may not even think to ask adolescents if they're using cigars. The other thing that we know about cigars is that they have a lot of um, tobacco and nicotine in them so that people who are smoking, they may say, oh, I'm just smoking one little cigar, but what's happening is you're actually getting a lot of nicotine from that one little cigar that can be way more than just one cigarette would be. And so often we'll have people say, well, it's not as dangerous, I'm only smoking one or I'm not inhaling it. However, even the fact that the fact that it's getting in your mouth and it's absorbing that way is going to cause some damage to um, to your mouth. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about is pipes. We don't hear about pipes as much because they're not as um, popular as they once were. There's only about 2% of the population that use pipes now. And again, because sometimes people don't use pipes on a daily basis because they are not actually sometimes inhaling it, it's, people will think, well, a pipe isn't as dangerous or I'm not at, as at risk. But what we know is that the health risks are actually the same. When you are smoking a pipe, you are still getting all of those, um, the tobacco within your mouth and you're getting some of those chemicals and they're absorbing and increase the chance for um, having any of the same things that you would if you're smoking a cigarette. This is commonly used by the American Indian and Alaska Native populations <clears throat> for ceremonial and medicinal purposes. So sometimes this is what has come up in other uses that we know of. Okay, the hookah or the shisha. This may be something that you have seen. There are hookah bars that are coming up. It's becoming more popular, and so we have to think about this with high school and college students. 16% um, of high school students have noted using a hookah or, or shisha, and 22 to 40% of college students. The problem that we run into here is that people think, okay, this isn't that dangerous, I'm not using it that often. They also think, well, there's, it's a water, it's being filtered, and so I'm actually not getting any of these toxins. And again, similar to when we think about cigars or pipes, you actually are getting these toxins there. There's similar health risks to using it. It's also exposing people to the addiction of nicotine. And we know that when high school students and college students are using these, their brains are still developing. And so the exposure to having the nicotine can set them up for a lifelong addiction of needing that nicotine. And so this is something we just need to be aware of because people will use this thinking that it's not going to cause that much damage or that it's not the same as smoking cigarettes, but it's just as dangerous. Smokeless tobacco. This is, um, there are many different types of smokeless tobacco out there, so you may have seen some of them and be aware of a few of them. The ones that um, we're going to talk about here are the chewing tobacco. There's different types of chewing tobacco. They can be sweetened, and again, this can be appealing to people because of the different flavor that can be in it. There's plugs. They're snuff, and you may have seen that some of them are uh, snooze that come in these packets, and so the tea-like packets are there. People don't have to uh, spit in the same way, and so, again, the tobacco companies have come up with all different ways that can appeal to people because they really want to get them to be using these products. 
I, we have often heard people say that they are not as concerned about it because they're not inhaling it. And so am I not getting as much damage by using these? And again, what we know is that you are actually getting um, just as much of the toxins by using these and that it can lead to many health risks, especially when we think of cancers of the mouth and the throat and the stomach. And there, when people are using smokeless tobacco, they're getting three to four times the amount of nicotine as someone who smokes. So while it might seem like, oh, I'm not getting that much, there's actually a lot of nicotine in this that you're using. I'm going to take over. Okay. Ooh, so um, if you're sitting here listening to this, you may, um, and, and if you are somebody who smokes or uses tobacco products, you may be feeling a little bit down right now. And I just want you to hang, hang tight. Um, the second half of our talk today is going to focus on helping you quit. Um, so we're not just here to lecture you about the health risks of smoking and tobacco products, um, but also how, how to stop using them. Um, so it wouldn't be a talk about tobacco if we didn't talk about e-cigarettes, right? The, the, this is in the news everywhere, um, something that is probably on your mind, um, particularly when it comes to teenagers and young people. Uh, so I did want to just take a minute here at the beginning to talk about the different um, types of e-cigarettes. They are all battery-operated devices that heat up a liquid solution and transforms it into an aerosol. Um, there's lots of different names, e-cigarettes, vape pens, vaping devices, tank systems, and they look um, very different too. So you'll see the um, first, uh, second, and third generation on the left-hand side of the screen, and then the more recent products on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the one that you will have heard a lot about recently is a company called Juul that um, developed and really... Um, to develop the, the most recent um, style of e-cigarette that has become so, so, so popular among young people in the last two years. Um, it looks like a USB drive, if you're familiar with that, or a small, um, a small little um, uh, kind of like a, a teardrop almost shape that you can see in the right-hand corner there. Um, and so Juul is this, the, this company that has really... Um, honed in this technology. So it launched in 2015, um, but really took over in the beginning of 2018. And it's incredibly appealing to young people because it comes in these exciting flavors like mango. Um, it can be really easily hidden. It actually, um, up until recently, I think teachers and, and parents alike didn't um, see it as anything different than a USB drive that they may be using for school, so it's easily hidden. Um, people can use it at work or um, in the classroom and disguise it very easily. Um, the last thing that I'll mention about Juul is that uh, they um, they honed in on the technology that allowed um, e-cigarettes to deliver very, very high levels of nicotine, um, significantly higher than the previous versions of electronic cigarettes, um, without causing irritation to the throat. Um, so if anybody used some of the older e-cigarettes, you probably noticed that if you used the higher concentrations of nicotine, it really, really irritated your throat. And so Juul um, uh, was, was smart, um, if you want to call it smart, um, and, and created um, a different type of nicotine that can deliver high levels um, without causing that irritation. And that's part of why it has um, taken over really the, um, uh, the whole um, market share of the electronic cigarettes. So this is just a slide showing exactly that right around um, tw late 2017, early 2018 where, when Juul took over. Um, this is uh, another slide just highlighting the, um, the appeal of Juul to youth, talking about how you can use it in class because it looks like something that you would be allowed to have in class, right? It looks like a, a school supply. Um, so what is actually in these products? I've, I, we've talked a lot about nicotine already, and nicotine is the thing that makes um, electronic cigarettes and to other tobacco products addictive. Um, but there's also lots of other things found in the aerosol of e-cigarettes, including um, some cancer-causing chemicals, heavy metals, um, things that are known to cause lung disease. Um, so they're not harmless, these substances that are in the aerosol. 
It's not um, just water vapor like you may hear. And uh, this has really come to the forefront of everybody's attention recently because uh, there have been some deaths associated with e-cigarette use. Um, so there's been 42 confirmed deaths um, as of November 13th and over 2,000 injuries associated with e-cigarette use. Um, this, uh, there is still ongoing investigation in this area, but all of the products uh, contain vitamin E acetate, which is a common, um, uh, it's commonly found in like skin creams. And so it's not thought to be harmful when it's absorbed through your skin. Um, but it seems to be causing harm when it's in, uh, uh, inhaled and absorbed in the lungs. Um, almost all of these products also contain THC or marijuana, um, and about 60% contain nicotine. So, so we're still really trying to figure out what exactly is causing, um, what in these e-cigarettes is causing the lung injury, but it seems like it's potentially vitamin E acetate, potentially THC, um, and things that are not supposed to be inhaled through the lungs that are causing this injury. Um, so they are not, not without harm. I'll also just briefly speak about burns. Um, our UNC hospital has, our burn center has seen a lot of these burns um, because there has been very little regulation of electronic cigarettes in the United States. Um, the, the batteries are sometimes um, ineffective and uh, have exploded on people and causing severe burns. Um, these are more common, so, so burns are fairly infrequent, still happen fairly infrequent, but the more common concern about e-cigarettes is this is shown in this slide right here. So you can see that, um, uh, you know, this 30% this here is the group that we're really not so concerned about. They're adults, right? We're talking about adults over 18 that used to smoke regular cigarettes and now are, have completely switched over and are using e-cigarettes. That there may be some potential benefit there, with the exception of the recent lung injury information. Um, but the other two categories are where we really start to worry, and unfortunately they're the majority. So there's about 11% of um, e-cigarette users who have never used regular tobacco products. So those are people that are now addicted to nicotine um, that wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, and this last category over here on the right um, is what happens most often, is that people use electronic cigarettes in an attempt to quit, um, and they continue using their regular cigarettes in addition to electronic cigarettes. So now you're getting the known risks of regular cigarettes, and you're getting the known and unknown risks of e-cigarettes, and those together are really quite worrisome from, from my perspective, from our program's perspective. Um, that's the majority of people that, that continue to use regular cigarettes. Um, and the other big area of concern around e-cigarettes is youth that we've mentioned already. So um, uh, the developing brain and nicotine don't, don't go well together. Um, it's a different thing when you're looking at nicotine in adults, but when you're looking at somebody whose brain is still developing, it, it is known to cause harm. Um, so increases risk of anxiety, depression, causes attention issues. Um, that you, you can imagine how that could, could lead to issue, problems in school and, and other um, problems for, for young people. Um, so this is a similar slide to the ones Susan showed earlier, but it's specifically looking at um, other forms of tobacco use. So our e-cigarette rate is um, now at 22%. I believe this is higher now. Again, this is data from 2017. It's close to 30% now in 2019. Um, so very, very high rates of e-cigarette use, um, which is concerning um, for a few reasons. I'm going to skip over that slide. Um, but one of the big reasons that it's concerning is that this is a, a large study um, commissioned by um, the National Academy of Sciences um, pulling together all of the data that we have about e-cigarettes. And the second bullet point um, is what I want to draw your attention to, which is that young people who use e-cigarettes um, are much more likely to go on later to smoke regular cigarettes. Uh, so that 30% or so of North Carolina young people that are using e-cigarettes um, is, is worrisome. And the last thing I'll just mention about this, uh, about this report, uh, which I've already touched on, is that the first point, which is that there's really um, 
not enough evidence to say that e-cigarettes actually help people quit smoking. Um, like I showed on that other slide, about 60% roughly of um, adults are still using their regular cigarettes. So people aren't, aren't quitting smoking, even if that's the original idea, which is a great idea. Um, and luckily we're going to talk more about today about ways that you can quit smoking and electronic cigarettes, both of them, for good. Um, so the bottom line here, e-cigarettes are not approved as an aid to quit smoking. Um, there's a potential that adults um, who smoke, if they completely switch over from regular cigarettes to e-cigarettes, there may be some potential benefits there. But there's also some risks, um, particularly with the recent lung injuries that have been um, documented and confirmed. It is definitely, e-cigarettes are definitely not safe for young people, uh, for pregnant women, um, and for adults who have never used any other type of tobacco product. And we still really don't understand the long-term health effects of e-cigarettes. I'm going to turn it back over to Susan. Okay, so now we're going to um, head into the area of talking about how do I become tobacco-free? How do I quit? And two things that we're going to think about today are the physical components of quitting and the behavioral components of it. And I'm going to take some time right now to talk about some of the physical components of it. What we know and what we talked about before is that there is a physical addiction to tobacco products. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have a little cold, so sometimes get this little cough coming. <clears throat> um, so one thing that we have to think about is that it is, it is understandable that you may have physical withdrawal symptoms. Totally normal if somebody's trying to quit smoking or quit any sort of tobacco product. So when we look at the quitting rates, if you were to just, if someone were to just quit cold turkey by themselves, only about three to five percent of the population are able to do that. So that's a pretty small percentage. And I say that and I want that not to discourage people, but to let you know that if you or someone that you know has tried to quit smoking and has been unsuccessful, that is completely normal and that we encourage people to continue to try. Um, with doctor's help, we know that that increases our chances to 10 to 12 percent. If you're using something like the quit line counseling, 11%, and if you use an intensive program such as the one we have here at UNC and in other places that combine both ongoing counseling and medications, you're about 30%. So you can see that your rates can really um, double to triple if you're able to use the, the, what we would say the standard of care, which is getting both medication and the counseling. So again, what are we thinking about here? We need to address both aspects. We need to talk about the medications and we need to also talk about behavior change plan because both come into play when we're using tobacco and we're trying to stop using them. As we've um, touched on before, there is this dependence on nicotine that comes with using any of the tobacco products. Now, nicotine is not what causes cancer. And I say this because we're, when we talk about some of the products that you can use to become tobacco free, people become concerned because they're using a nicotine replacement product. Nicotine is actually not the cancer causing. Um, it does uh, have people become very addicted to things. And again, I'm gonna explain on another slide why when you're using the tobacco products, that nicotine is more likely to be addictive than using something like nicotine replacement. Some of the things that we know about nicotine is that it's a stimulant, and so it increases feelings of pleasure and happiness, it improves our attention, it reduces appetite, it increases our GI motility, and, and it constricts our blood vessels. So we know that people are getting this positive reinforcement when they're using nicotine, so it makes sense why people want to keep using it and why we have to address that physical component. We know that, um, that nicotine is as addictive as alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, heroin. Um, what they try to tell you, what the industry tries to tell you is that it's, you know, it's similar to caffeine. They try to play it off like it's not that um, big of an addiction, something that you should just be able to stop. And we want people to know that the reason we say this is, again, is not to discourage people, but to let them know that we understand that it can be very challenging and that it's normal to um, to seek assistance in doing this. And so just as we would with alcohol or any other substance, there are programs that are out there that can really help people to become tobacco free. 
some withdrawal symptoms that you um, that you may be aware of or have, if you have tried to become tobacco free, you may have experienced or somebody that you know may have. Uh, Irritability and frustration, anger, that is a really common one that we hear people talk about, as well as increased cravings and urges to smoke or to vape. Some other things, again, would be difficulty concentrating, restlessness, you might feel a little bit more depressed, people have trouble sleeping, um, and they have anxiety. And so when, when someone tries to stop smoking or using any tobacco products, it's not uncommon that within the, you know, the first they may feel this within the first few hours and maybe day two or three that they really start to notice these feelings. And so this is where the tobacco cessation medication can really come into play for you. So some of those medications that are out there to really help people to address that nicotine withdrawal, um, there's seven that are out there and we usually find that some people have heard of some of them but not all of them. So we just do want people to be aware of what's, what's out there. Uh, the common ones people have heard of are the nicotine patch and the nicotine gum. They've been around the longest. But there's some other ones that are out there as well. There's a nicotine lozenge. And the patch and the gum and the lozenge, they're all over the counter. So if someone were to go into Walmart or Target or any of the pharmacies, you can see them over the counter. There, You don't need a prescription for them. There's also a nicotine nasal spray and a, nic a nicotrol oral inhaler. There's Chantix and there is an, another medication called Wellbutrin. Sometimes people have heard of Wellbutrin because it is also used as an antidepressant. So we're not gonna have time to go over these all extensively, but we do want you to know about them so that you could talk with your doctor about these medications. We know that this in increases someone's chances of quitting by three times. Um, it really helps to address some of those withdrawal symptoms. It can also help reduce the weight gain because people are not having as extensive cravings to smoke, which sometimes can lead to people then reaching for um, food instead. Okay, so what we do know as far as best practice, again, first of all, I'm just going to say, we know that any of the medications are going to increase people's chances of being able to quit because it's going to address those withdrawal symptoms. But the standard of care, the best practice that we know that's out there is using what we call combination nicotine replacement therapy. This is where you use the patch with something that's short acting like the gum or the lozenge. And we want to point this out because we know that lots of times people have heard they can't use them together and you actually can use these two products together. Uh, there's also um, the other thing that is uh, known to be best practice is using 12 weeks of Chantix. One other thing I just want to say about nicotine replacement is that um, lots of times people have heard that they can't smoke if they're using a nicotine replacement product, and that's actually not true. Um, it, what we tell people is if they start to notice, you know, if they have the patch on and they end up having a, a cigarette or two, if you start to feel that, you know, I'm getting too much nicotine, like I feel lightheaded or I feel dizzy or I feel kind of sick, that's your body's way of saying I'm getting enough nicotine, but we don't want you to be hesitant to put the nicotine patch on or use nicotine or, or gum thinking that you can't um, because you might end up slipping and having a cigarette. Uh, Sometimes people will say to us that they're really worried they're going to get hooked on the nicotine replacement, and that is really unlikely. And this, um, just really quickly to tell you a little bit about this graph, what this shows is how quickly the nicotine is getting to our brain. So as you can see with the cigarette line, the nicotine gets to your brain within 8 to 10 seconds if you're using it. And if, you use the, um, if you're using any sort of smokeless tobacco, it's a little slower uptake to the brain, but you can see that it, both the cigarette and the smokeless tobacco are higher than any of the nicotine replacement products. That means we're not getting that same fast uh, hit that you're getting from nicotine, but you are getting it and you're getting it at a little lower level, a little more constant level, which is what really helps people to be able to not reach for that cigarette or um, smokeless tobacco and yet not become addicted to that product. So you're much less likely to. I'm going to turn it over to Laurel. She's going to talk about some of the behavioral strategies on how to quit because we know it really takes both. So when I'm thinking about this, I think about um, if you smoke or, or vape or know anybody who does, you think about all of the reminders that you have every single day 
of smoking or vaping. Um, you know, the, your average person smokes about a pack a day, so you have at least 20 reminders a day of smoking. Um, and th this is where, where, when we talk about behavior change plan, that, that's what really what we're talking about, is how do you figure out what you're gonna do instead those 20 times a day when you usually would reach for your vape pen or va um, jewel or your cigarette. Um, and so, it, it, like I mentioned, there's those 20 times a day, you have that hand-to-mouth reminder, um, you know, cravings in certain situations, for some people it's social interaction, there's lots of different reminders depending on the person. Uh, some common, we call them triggers, um, these reminders of smoking or vaping, and so some common ones for people that you've probably heard of too are drinking coffee, um, drinking alcohol too for that matter, um, when you're driving in the car, um, being bored or stressed or really most emotions um, are, are common triggers for smoking, um, being at a bar or in a situation around alcohol or in with friends who are smoking, um, after meals is a very, very common uh, reminder of smoking. Uh, breaks at work, uh, when talking on the phone, and then being around certain people. I don't think these are going to come as a surprise to any of you. And this is going to sound overly simplistic. Um, but okay, so imagine this scenario. Um, I think most people can identify with this one. You're driving home, it's late at night, and you go in that autopilot mode where you aren't even quite aware of how you get home. And all of a sudden, you're in the drive through line at your favorite fast food restaurant. And you don't really quite remember how you got there. Um, I think most people can identify with that. And the reason I bring up that story is because it's like that with smoking, except for it's 20 or 40 times a day, where all of a sudden you have this cigarette or your jewel device in your hand, and you don't even quite realize how it happened. And so it's important to have a plan in advance. You have to, it, it seems really simple, but you need to think ahead of time about what you're going to do instead, because you... You don't want to get in that situation where all of a sudden it's right here and you have to stop yourself because that's going to be really, really difficult to do. Um, so these are some strategies that people have told us in our program over the years are helpful uh, to do when you're having a craving for, for a smoke or for um, a vape. And um, just let take everybody a minute to read them over. We have this on our website as well, which is the tobacco treatment, UNC tobacco treatment program. And then what you want to do is you want to practice linking these together. So as silly as it sounds, you want to repeat this out loud to yourself. If I feel stressed and I want to smoke, then I will practice deep breathing. Say it over a few times out loud. Talk to a mirror, talk to your friend, whoever will listen. Um, and it has to be really personalized to you. So what it, whatever that that situation is that you're worried about. Think about that situation and think about what you could realistically do instead of smoking or vaping and then say it out loud. So I'll just briefly mention a little bit about where to get help. We've talked about your doctor's office already um, and most healthcare professionals should know the information that we shared with you today. Um, uh, but the common, most common places to go probably is your primary care doctor, your oncologist if you have one, your cardiologist if you have one. Um, they should be able to write the prescriptions that Susan talked about earlier. There's also lots of free resources in North Carolina. We have an amazing quit line service, which is a free telephone counseling line, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, they always offer free telephone counseling in, um, I can't remember how many languages, but it's like 200 languages. They have, um, yes. Lots of um, interpreter services available. And then they also offer free nicotine replacement sometimes. So for example, for people without any insurance, they offer, I believe, eight weeks of free nicotine replacement therapy um, that they mail to your house. So that's another good reason to call the counseling, but also the free medication. And there are lots of now free online and text programs too. Um, Smokefree.gov is the most popular one. Um, and uh, there is also a specific texting program for Juul or vaping, uh, and it's targeting young people, but anybody can use it, uh, and you just have to text Ditch Juul to 8709. 
There, we have uh, our UNC Tobacco Treatment Program, which is here in Chapel Hill. Um, our phone number is listed there on our website, and you can learn more about our programs as well. Um, most of our programs are face-to-face, -face, so it's more for local people, um, but we um, will soon have telephone services as well. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Laurel, for that presentation. I hope everybody um, learned something new. I know I did. I didn't realize that there was a texting campaign for young people, and that actually addresses one of the questions that came in, mm -hmm. and it is um, about how can a parent who knows their teen is using these products, what, what would be the, the next steps that he or she can take to help their child? Well, you sure. <clears throat> um, I think there's a, a few different things. I think one is just being able to um, kind of bring up the conversation, uh, start the conversation, and also normalize it because as we showed in the data, it's not uncommon that a lot of teenagers are using the jewel. They're experimenting with it. And lots of times they don't think that there's any harm to it. So I think just sort of starting the conversation with them about it, see what they like about it, see what their concerns are about it. Um, and letting them know that there are resources that are out there and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to talk with somebody. They can use things like this um, where they can text to different programs. Sometimes just even also letting them know, you know, if they're willing, would they be, uh, would they be open to hearing some information about it? Because lots of times, again, they're not, they don't, they're not aware that there is danger to it. So maybe being able to direct them to some of the things that they could even look at on their own time, on the on websites about some of the, the hazards and the dangers to it. Um, as Laurel was talking about before, <clears throat> some of that information is getting out there more now because of the injuries and the deaths that have come. But um, again, I think it's just sort of allowing for that conversation to start and knowing that there are some resources out there. Great. Thank you. I'll just add, if you do have a teenager who's more severely addicted and you're really worried about them, our program does see um, teenagers who vape um, and, and teenagers mm -hmm. who use other tobacco products too, so feel free to um, you know, call, call our number. Great. Um, we had another question, and if you all have any questions, the email address is on the screen right now, and they'll pop up right here and we could answer them for you. But another question was about um, managing chemotherapy and radiation and the stress of having cancer mm -hmm. while also um, using tobacco products and how they can tackle um, trying to quit and trying to you know, get healthy and all those things. Do you all have any advice about that? Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a really um, great question and one that we hear a lot. We do have a, a program here that works specifically in our cancer center. So. Um, if, if this person happens to be getting treatment here at UNC, we do have a program for, for that, and sometimes some other hospitals have it as well. But one thing I would say is that makes complete sense because we know that when people are going through very stressful times, what, it, what happens is people want to reach for what they know is comfortable and what has worked in the past. And so one of the things I, I heard you say in there was the idea of getting healthy and so sort of one of those things is focusing on that um, and how, how do I get to that point of what I'm working towards, which is to be healthy. And so thinking of things that are going to help you when you're feeling stressed and then maybe trying different things that you haven't tried before because any of those times that you're reaching for that cigarette or any of those tobacco products, we want to think about what could I do instead. Um, I also would encourage you to, to potentially talk with your doctor about some of the medications that are out there so you're not having to do it totally on your own. So again, there's, that, there's the counseling support, but there's also um, being able to really think of some things to do. So what we sometimes will have people do is write down the most common times that you are wanting to reach for that um, cigarette. What's going on? How are you feeling? And then what can I do instead during those moments? And then practice those and see how it works. Just experiment with it. Just see what, what you can do. And also being patient with yourself because this takes time and you may feel like you need to do it this minute because you're in the middle of treatment. And what we say is just really really um, just practice and keep at it. Um, so again, the medication and becoming, coming up with some of those behavioral strategies. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just <clears throat> I'll add to that some of that stress might be related to nicotine withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So I'll just you know, emphasize that, that talking to your oncologist about the medications could actually help make it quite a bit easier for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have a vaping question. What does it mean to purchase vaping products on the black market? I guess I've heard that on mm -hmm. the news myself, so I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably where this question is coming from. I, are the, does that mean non-traditional ways of buying Juul, for example? Can you speak more to that? Um, I think it means a lot of different things. Um, with the thing I've heard most commonly that people do is they'll use a, um, a purchased uh, vaping device like, say, Juul, but they will um, modify using... Um, home experiments, they'll modify the liquid that goes in the cartridge. That's the thing I've heard most often done. Um, I know there are other people too who try to create their whole own um, device and then sell that. Um, but the most, uh, the thing I've heard most often is people tweaking with the liquid um, or the, the cartridges that go in them and adding other substances, things like that. And that, that is what, what people are thinking is happening with these lung injuries. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, well, I think you guys asked some wonderful questions, and I just want to, um, again, remind you that that email address is on the screen, and if you have questions that come into your mind later this afternoon, feel free to submit them, and I'm sure we'll be able to get some feedback and get that back to you. Um, I want to, again, thank you guys for your time today. I know we all learned a lot. And I wanted to let you guys know that we will not be having Cancer Conversations next month, December, and so the next time we'll see you is actually in January, where we'll be talking about pancreatic cancer. We've gotten a lot of feedback from you as the audience that you would like to learn more about pancreatic cancer. So we'll be doing that in January, on Friday, January 24th. Um, so with that, we'll just say um, happy holidays and happy new year, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.